Persevering. Persevering. We love technology, Persevering. don't we? <laughs> Indeed. Well, good evening, everyone. And we're so glad you're here. Um, we are excited um, to welcome you and be in conversation. Um, and so, hello, Hillary. <laughs> yes, this is so much fun. Um, this is um, our third Instagram Live, our Monday Moments with Montpelier. I'm so excited to be in conversation with you um, about uh, the women of Montpelier. Um, and, and so my sort of entree into doing history and talking about history actually started with a conversation around women's suffrage. Um, and um, Frederick Douglass and um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton um, and so many others who, um, you know, came together, galvanized, um, representing different perspectives and, and views. And that's the work that we do at Montpelier. And you've had a chance um, to do this for some time. How many years have you been with Montpelier? Share I that with everyone. I just passed my 14 year anniversary on March the 1st. Ah, amazing. Amazing, amazing 14 years um, with Montpelier, um, helping us to expand and grow and reimagine interpretation over the years and tell all stories. Um, and, you know, many people know about Dolly Madison. What are some of the things that you hope everyone knows um, or you'd like them to know that sometimes people may not realize about Dolly Madison? And then we'll start talking about some of the other women who helped to shape Montpelier as well as the nation. Well, I just happened to be carrying around a picture of Dolly Madison for the occasion. I think um, the first thing I think about with Dolly Madison is how she and James Madison were really two halves of a power couple. Mm. And she brought the people skills. He was the more intellectual person, a little more aloof. She was the person who was able to bring people together okay. uh, in, in the White House. And even before they went to the White House, uh, when, they were, when he was Secretary of State and they were living in Washington, D.C., she made their home a social center that really rivaled the Jefferson White House. Wow. And I know we all think about these Jeff Jeffersonian dinners with like a, a question, a prompting question that, you know, helps us to, you know, exercise our mind and our ability to solve problems and think about, you know, incredible ideas. Um, one of the things I understand Dolly Madison was known for is, is bipartisan, like, social experiences. Do you want to share anything with anyone about about that um, before we jump into some of these other women of Montpelier. Sure. I mean, she really brought people together. Uh, she hosted a Wednesday evening event that was uh, called a drawing room. Mm. Uh, and sometimes they were so crowded that people referred to them as squeezes because people were squeezed in together. And they were open to everyone. And it really gave a social outlet for people of both parties to come together. But she was very savvy. So she, she would treat everyone equal who came in. They said that you couldn't tell by her demeanor uh, whether she was talking to someone who was her husband's political foe or friend, but she knew who was who. She was keeping track. Oh. So she was very savvy. That's so interesting and so relevant. I mean, we pride ourselves in Montpelier being a place where people of different um, backgrounds, knowledge, experience can all come and ask the difficult questions of history, also experience the incredible landscape. So as we start our conversation and thinking about, you know, what other women were helping to shape um, the Madisons, the experience, you know, across Montpelier, you know, um, who were they? Um, one of the uh, women who you've mentioned to me is Frances Taylor Madison. Mm -hmm. Um, tell us who Frances was um, and how she was involved um, with uh, Montpelier. So Frances was James, President James Madison's grandmother. She was the wife of Ambrose Madison. And Ambrose Madison is the one, <coughs> excuse me, was the first owner of the property that became known as Montpelier. It was Mount Pleasant mm -hmm. at that time. And Actually, the way that Ambrose acquired Montpelier 
was through Francis's father. Uh, he was uh, one of the Knights of the Golden Horseshoe, friends of Governor Alexander Spotswood, who had accompanied Spotswood out here on an exploration trip, looking to see what land might be available to be patented. And so, uh, uh, excuse me, James Taylor then was uh, surveying some lands out here. And the property that became Montpelier was actually a property that he received as a, as a fee for surveying someone else's lands. And he had it patented in the name of his two sons-in-law, Thomas Chu and Ambrose Madison. So it became known as the Chu Madison patent. So initially, Ambrose Madison sent out a group of enslaved laborers under an overseer to get started at Mount, at Mount Pleasant. And uh, after several years, then he brought his family out here, Francis and their three children. And then he died only a few months after coming out here. And it was thought that he was the victim of a poisoning. Mm. There was a trial and three enslaved people were found guilty of the poisoning. We don't know what the evidence was that was presented, but Pompey was uh, found guilty and he was actually hanged. Uh, Turk and Dido were found to be complicit, and they were whipped and returned to Montpelier. The curious thing is that Pompey was actually leased by Ambrose Madison. He was not, he was enslaved by somebody else in the area. So it's kind of hard to imagine what his motivation was. Uh, and certainly something like a poisoning is something that you don't do in the heat of the moment. It was something that would be planned out. So there, there are parts of the story that are still kind of a mystery to us, but primary uh, uh, record is the actual court case. Were there other documents? Really just the verdict, oh. the verdict and the sentences. So we don't know what evidence was presented in the trial. And that would be really, that's really challenging. Knew that. Well, one of the texts that I suggest um, folks consider reading is called Ain't I a Woman by Deborah Gray White. Um, and it um, provides some insight into the experiences of enslaved people and some of the ways that resistance mm -hmm. was represented. Um, and um, feigning illness, you know, um, flight and escape. Um, as well as, you know, poisoning. These are I, ways that um, people resisted enslavement. Um, and so it's also challenging not having, you know, more history, um, more documents um, to understand the sort of history of events that leads up to that moment. Um, but what you're sharing, it tells us who these individuals were. We mm -hmm. were able to document their presence, um, which in some ways helps us to reveal that hidden history. Yes. Um, anything else you want us to know about um, Francis Taylor Madison? Yes, I kind of got off track with uh, telling that story about the poisoning. So that left Francis as a widow. And then she continued to operate the plantation until her son, James Madison, that we think of as James Madison Sr., future president's father. When he came of age, they ran it jointly. And it's interesting to see in James Madison Sr.'s account books, he definitely keeps track separately of the tract that he is uh, operating with his mother. Uh, the tobacco barrels have their initials stamped on them as opposed to the tract that he is operating that has hit his initials and his wife's initials on it. Mm -hmm. But uh, we certainly see Frances as one of the strong women of Montpelier mm -hmm. that she was continuing to manage the plantation on her own for a while. I can't imagine. Um, and there's so many questions I have. And I know there's so many women who we want to talk about um, this evening. Um, it gives me ideas as to conversations we have to continue. Um, and so I hope for those of you who've joined us this evening, you're you know recognizing that this isn't a one and done. You know, we tell all stories 365 days of the year. And so we um, welcome Women's History Month as it prepares us to tell these stories every day. Um, and so another um, uh, woman who really gives us insight into the Madisons, the Madison family, um, is Anne Payne Custon. Custon. Uh, yes, tell us more about um, Dolly's niece, who was more like a daughter really too. Yeah. yeah, I think 
you know, Dolly had the one son from her first marriage. She didn't have any daughters. And I think she was always looking for kind of a daughter relationship. She was very close to her younger sister. She had nieces that she was very close to, friends of the family that she was close to who were younger and kind of daughter-like. And Annie Payne Coston was uh, one that she was especially close to. That was her brother's child. And her brother lived on an uh, adjacent property, actually a part of Montpelier that had been carved out as a farm for his use. And Dolly became especially close to Annie. And then when Dolly's brother and his family moved out west, she asked that Annie be able to stay with her. Mm -hmm. And so it was, Annie describes it as being a very touching scene because they, they were very sad and parting, she and her father and the rest of her family. But she was very close to Dolly and remained as her companion. So even after Dolly was widowed and moved up to Washington, D.C., Annie continued uh, to live with her. Uh, Dolly relied on her in a lot of different ways. Uh, and kind of an interesting way is that Annie learned to imitate Dolly's handwriting. Oh. And Dolly in her later years had a lot of trouble with her eyesight. And so Dolly would start a letter and when, she, when her eyes got tired, she would turn it over to Annie to write the bo body of the letter. And then uh, Dolly would step back in to write the signature at the end. Wow. That's incredible. Um, <laughs> and such a close relationship. Mm -hmm. um, I can imagine that that was, um, you know, especially important, um, especially in, in Dolly's later years, as you describe. Um, now, we've talked a little bit about um, uh, Dolly Madison's family, James Madison's family, but there's also um, Nellie Madison Willis. Um, who was James Madison's niece. Um, what was their relationship like? Well, they were close for a different reason. Uh, she was the daughter of James's brother Ambrose, who died rather young. And so James Madison was actually her ward, mm -hmm. or she was his ward, he was mm -hmm. her guardian. And so they became close for that reason. She also lived very close to Montpelier. Uh, for a while, she kept an eye on Montpelier on some of the domestic duties while the Madisons were up in Washington, D.C. And then according to what Paul Jennings writes in his reminiscences, Nellie was actually with James Madison when he died. Really? And she apparently had been sitting up with him. Suki Stewart came in with Madison's breakfast. Nellie noticed that he was having some trouble swallowing. And she said, what is the matter, Uncle James? And Paul Jennings tells us that uh, James Madison replied, nothing more than a change of mind, my dear. And then that's the moment when he passed away. We do learn so much about James Madison through the writings of Paul Jennings. Mm -hmm. um, and so it might be worth, you know, sharing with everyone just a tad about his relationship, who Paul Jennings was. But then also, am I correct, um, uh, Suki is one of the um, enslaved people at Montpelier who um, was connected to the Pearl Affair, which was an example of um, escape and flight, um, mm -hmm. which would be uh, an amazing story um, associated with the Network to Freedom program. Um, I, I would love for us to consider an application to that program through the National Park Service one day. Um, do you want to just let people know who Paul Jennings was and who Suki mm -hmm. was? So uh, Paul Jennings was an enslaved man servant of Madison during his retirement years. When he was a little bit younger, when Madison was in the White House, uh, he served at table. And, and serving as a waiter was a skill that he used throughout his lifetime. Uh, but particularly during Madison's retirement, he shaved Madison every other day. He ran his errands. He uh, was... Uh, working very closely under Madison. And then in the 1860s, he actually wrote a reminiscence of Madison. Um, I should, I skipped a couple of parts here, but um, Jennings became free. Dolly Madison sold him to an intermediary who sold him to Daniel Webster. 
and Webster allowed him to work off his purchase price. So he was actually uh, freed in the 1830s or 40, 40s, I would say. And uh, he had a government job. He worked for the pension office. And there he befriended someone who had done a lot of writing for historical magazine and took down his stories that he had been telling. Now, Jennings was literate. He could have written his own story, but that was how this uh, came about, that the reminiscences were written down. And it really does give us a very uh, personal insight into Madison. Yeah. And then uh, Suki was a member of the Stewart family, and she served as Dolly's maid uh, for many years. And then it was her daughter, Ellen Stewart, later Ellen Stewart White, who uh, was one of the people who escaped on the Pearl. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what happened was Ellen heard, overheard a conversation that apparently Ellen was going to be sold. And so she escaped at that point. And then when she became aware that the, the Pearl plan was happening, she was one of the about 77 people who escaped on the Pearl. And a lot of what we know about this story actually comes from a series of articles that were written in an abolitionist, abolitionist newspaper. And so we get some insight there. And when, uh, when the Pearl was captured, Ellen and other people were put into jail. And Ellen was fortunate in that a group of nor or a Northern abolitionist uh, purchased her freedom. And so she went to uh, with Boston at that point. She married, she had a daughter. And then her granddaughter became a very well-known uh, educator in the, the early 20th century, actually attended a White House conference on education, which is just amazing to think that you know, her great grandmother had been um, an enslaved servant at the White House. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I hope she knew all those stories and, and realized what a journey her family had made. It's incredible how there are so many like full circle, you know, narratives um, that that we're aware of. And that's especially true with the descendant engagement work um, that uh, Montpelier has been able to pursue um, for more than 20 years. Um, mm -hmm. And so when you think about um, Gilmore Cabin being restored and um, that incredible work, um, the preservation of Madison's home, um, our expanded work with archeology span and in preparation for the memorial. Um, but one of our unique um, initiatives is the naming project um, which you lead um, and has helped to bring forward um, as many names as we know of the 300 enslaved people um, who um, lived and labored at Montpelier. That, um, you know, that was forced labor um, and that it is a hard history. Um, mm -hmm. It's challenging for all of us. Um, but there are several folks who we wanted to um, remember um, in our conversation tonight. Um, why don't you tell us about um, um, Elsie Payne, am I mm -hmm. saying her name right? Elsie Payne, um, and how we've learned about her and what documents revealed that story. Yeah, uh, the main reason that we know about Elsie Payne is that a newspaper writer interviewed her and published a story about her. And the story that he quotes her on is about Lafayette's visit which coming up on the 200th anniversary of Lafayette's return visit to the United States. And so she had a lot of interesting insights. She said she was just a house servant or house girls, how she referred to herself at that point. She became a cook later on, but she was involved in cleaning everything, making sure all the, the glassware and the silver was sparkling. She remembered how all the food was stored in the ice house. Uh, she lists chickens and turkeys and all different kinds of meats. And so we know about Elsie Payne from those stories, 
but uh, some of our previous researchers were also able to track her in the census. Mm -hmm. And so we know in later years uh, after the Civil War, she was living in Culpeper with a grandson. So it kind of uh, ties it all together when you have not only the personal type of story that was recorded in the newspaper, but to also be able to track somebody through the census as well. Yeah. So those documents, you know, we've been talking about this um, since the beginning of February. They really, you know, are critical. I mean, that's foundational to how we do history um, and how we um, document family stories. Um, but it's also um, relevant in terms of how we expand um, interpretation and tell um, all stories. Um, mm -hmm. And so that combination of oral traditions, archaeology, um, and documentation really helps us to tell a full and complete story. Um, and so thinking about um, freedom and liberty um, and Montpelier, um, another interesting story is um, Catherine Stewart Taylor. Um, what, what's that story? Uh, she is another really fascinating person to me. Uh, she was here at Montpelier first as a young woman. And uh, she was, well, she was a steward at that point. We didn't realize that for many years. We didn't realize that until I came across uh, Suki Stewart's will and realized that Catherine was one of her daughters. So we've called her Catherine Taylor for a long time, but now we know we can call her Catherine Stewart Taylor. So she was married to Ralph Taylor. Both of them were enslaved domestic workers. They were sometimes separated when uh, during Dolly's widowhood, she starts to spend more and more time up in Washington, DC. And then after she sells Montpelier, Catherine and Ralph are both up in Washington, DC. And then after Dolly dies, her son, John Payne Todd dies only a couple of years later. And in his will, he said that the people he enslaved at that point should be freed, mm -hmm. but the, his debts exceeded the value of his estate. And so most of the enslaved people were sold. But Catherine and Ralph and their children were still up in Washington, DC, and they actually sued for their freedom. And they won it on a very technical argument. Uh, before Dolly sold Montpelier, she had actually transferred ownership of almost all of the enslaved people to her son, John Payne Todd. And at that point, there was a law in Washington, DC that said you couldn't import slaves into the capital city. Mm -hmm. The one loophole was that you could, if you were an enslaver who moved to Washington, DC, you had a, a year's window that you could bring the people you had previously enslaved into the capital city. So when Dolly moved to Washington, she was kind of working on the idea that the people that were coming up were the people that she enslaved, but in reality, they were enslaved by John Payne Todd. Mm -hmm. She was a resident of Washington, DC, he was not. Mm -hmm. So they were able, Catherine and Ralph were able to make their case in court to say that they had been brought illegally into Washington, DC by someone who did not live in Washington, John Payne Todd. And so they were able to gain their freedom. And it's, it's interesting, there were a number of enslaved people who were able to sue successfully in that way. And it kind of makes you wonder, you know, what kind of uh, network of people were talking to each other in Washington and making each other aware that this was an avenue that they could pursue. Yes, absolutely. I, we often think about Philadelphia um, and having these vigilant societies that um, could advise. Um, I had not realized um, that um, there was this, you know, level of success in Washington as well. Um, with um, uh, enslaved people being able to use the system itself um, and the laws themselves um, to gain their freedom. Um, so that's um, really interesting. Um, there's one additional um, member of the enslaved community who um, I was, I'm curious about. Um, and I wondered if you'd tell us about Abby um, and what we know about Abby um, and, and why, why, why is there a little bit of an information gap? Yeah, Abby is one of the people who has very, very short biography in the naming project because 
We just don't know much about her. She only appears in two sources. She appears in James Madison Sr.'s tax records in the 1780s. There's about a five year period from 1782 to 86 mm -hmm. where enslaved people are listed by name rather than just by uh, age and, and gender categories. And so we know Abby was here in the 1780s. And there's also a fascinating document that is in James Madison Sr.'s miscellaneous papers. And it's a day in November of 1787 when shoes were issued to the enslaved community. And so it's a listing of about 50 people's names and their shoe sizes. And we know that Abby had a size five shoe which given the range of sizes, I think the women's sizes were about five to nine. So she was either a young girl or a very petite woman uh, with a size five shoe. And what a random thing to know about somebody. And yet it's, it's a very personal detail too. Uh, maybe it doesn't tell us a lot about Abby, but we feel we know something kind of, kind of personal about her. That's what's so amazing about the work that you do with the naming project and the collaborations with the Montpelier Descendant Committee, as well as, you know, the broader community of descendants. Um, and I've seen a lot of folks who I'd love to say hello to. Um, Dr. Andrea Roberts has popped in. Um, Phyllis Terrell um, has also popped in. Um, there's such a huge community of people out here who are doing descendant engagement work um, and the um, work of the National Trust and the Montpelier um, Descendant Committee and uh, the Montpelier Foundation um, brought forward the uh, descendant engagement rubric in um, 2018. Um, and that has really helped us to um, tell all of these incredible stories. Um, and so as we you know, continue to explore the history of the Madisons, explore the Constitution, think about the landscape um, and how we're all connected to this landscape, regardless of whether we're, you know, able to claim uh, lineal descent or blood relation, um, even to each other, you know, we are connected by our um, shared interest um, and commitment to telling, you know, all of these stories. Um, and, and the naming project really helps us um, to do that. Um, and so that for me is um, particularly exciting. Um, I mentioned, I think last time that I consider myself a, a, a museum nerd and a <laughs> history nerd. Um, and so it's nice to feel at home at Montpelier and exploring all of this history. Um, and so thinking about some of the acquaintances of the Madisons um, that we may be familiar with, you know, names that we hear often, the Custis Lee family, we don't you know, always have an opportunity to um, speak in more detail. Um, tell us about Eliza Custis Lee and what made um, her so significant as a friend to Dolly. Um, uh, tell us about that. Yeah. yeah, she was literally a lifelong friend. And I think that's a really special relationship. She and Dolly met each other uh, when they were both living in Philadelphia. They were both uh, Quakers, so they were in a very specific community and became close with each other. And then you know, Dolly uh, married the second time to James Madison, so she moved away. They were separated for a while. Eliza married Richard Bland Lee. And then around the time that Dolly and James are in Washington, D.C., Eliza and Richard moved to the Washington, D.C. area, so they sort of renew their friendship. Then when uh, James and Dolly retire back to Montpelier at the end of his presidency, they're separated. But then Dolly moves back to Washington in her widowhood. And so she and Eliza are reunited. And Eliza was actually with her at the time she died. So she, Eliza was witness to Dolly's first marriage and she was present at Dolly's funeral. So that's, that's pretty much a lifelong yes. friendship. That's a lifelong friendship indeed. Um, when we think about, you know, the complicated nature of um, slavery and we think about um, plantation life, I mean, we realize that there were 
um, you know, roles that, that are quite difficult and challenging. And one of the ways that we've been able to document and explore those is through the uh, Community Archaeology pro Program led by um, Dr. Matt Reeves. Um, we have many partnerships um, with James Madison University, um, with Wake Forest University. Um, we have an incredible archaeology team. So shout out to all of our team. Uh, team members with um, archaeology and especially those of you out there in the field who have ever participated um, in a field school at Montpelier um, and I get excited every time I meet and engage with archaeologists and they say that they completed a field school um, under the leadership of Matt Reeves because um, we know how incredible and important that work has been in helping us to tell um, all stories. Um, and so as we think about um, another woman who was on the landscape um, and, um, and impacted um, the lives of enslaved people, impacted uh, Montpelier, um, Mrs. Gooch is um, one of those women. Um, what, what do we know about her? We know very little, really. We know she was married to the overseer Gideon Gooch. And he was overseer during the years that uh, James and Dolly Madison were in Washington, D.C. And overseers' wives, in general, had an interesting position. I mean, they were not officially doing anything. Uh, the overseer was the one who was hired by the plantation owner. But overseers' wives oftentimes were people who could be called in to be paid to do some particular kind of work. And the one letter where Mrs. Gooch shows up is a letter that Nellie Willis, we talked about before, that she sometimes kept an eye on the plantation. Nellie Willis wrote to Dolly in Washington and talked about trying to get some merino wool spun. Mm. And this, this was at a time when merino sheep were kind of the in thing. James Madison and a lot of other people thought they could improve the quality of American wool by introducing merinos. And Nellie said she had learned that the merino wool was very difficult to spin and that the women who were spinners at Montpelier at that point apparently didn't know how to handle the merino wool. And so Nellie Willis said, I asked Mrs. Gooch to do it, but she alleged the want of time mm. uh, for not being able to do it. And I just, I find that the phrasing very interesting because Mrs. Gooch just basically said, no, I don't have time to do this. And I think even women today find it very challenging sometimes when we're asked to do one more thing. But sometimes we just have to say, no, we, we must allege the want of time, but we cannot do it. Oh my goodness. That reminds me of a meme that I think I've seen recently where it's like, she could, but she said no. <laughs> and, um, uh, I, I want to say hello to a couple more folks who I've seen who have popped in and out. Um, I saw that Mary Furlong um, was on earlier. Um, I hope that she's hey, here Mary. to join us again. Um, I see Omar Eaton Martinez has popped in. Hello to our dear, you know, friends and leadership um, with the National Trust. Um, and uh, I mean, this is um, incredible our ability to start to tell some of these what what we often call hidden histories um, and really bring um, the the presence impact and contributions of women you know into the core narrative um, and you know as we know we oftentimes can have this siloed history but that's not how people lived on the landscape um, and so me personally I like my history the way it uh, occurred on the landscape <laughs> and so I like to understand how people lived together, how they impacted one another's lives. Um, if we kind of fast forward in time, there's more than one period of significance that's important at Montpelier. Um, and one in particular really helped to shape how people relate um, to Montpelier today. Um, and that's the um, DuPont family era, um, mm -hmm. when Marion um, DuPont Scott um, owned and operated uh, Montpelier. Um, and boy, did she have a lasting impact um, on Montpelier, on Orange, on Virginia. Um, to this day, we have the uh, Montpelier Steeplechase Equestrian Foundation. And the first uh, Saturday in November each year, we have the Steeplechase Race. 
Um, what, what should we know about um, Mary DuPont Scott um, as um, one of the uh, last women to live at Montpelier um, historically um, and own the property? Yeah, she was really a fascinating person and horses were a huge part of her life. And she's known for a couple of firsts. One of her firsts is that she was the first woman to win her class in a horse show at Madison Square Garden while riding astride, as opposed to side saddle, which was more common for women in the early 20th century. And uh, she said something in her memoirs to the effect of, she just never really thought it was that big of a deal, but everybody else had made a big deal of it. And then uh, what really got her attention in the racing world was that her horse battleship who in 1934 was the first American bred, American owned horse to win the British Grand National Steeplechase. And so that really put her on the map. And then she just made use of Montpelier in a very specific way for raising and training racehorses. So she made a big impact on the landscape just with the number of barns that she had built here, many of which were the Sears barns that you could order from the catalog. So even though she was a very wealthy woman, she uh, spent her money wisely and she ordered her barns from Sears. <laughs> um, so she made a big impact on the land. chase races that you referred to. And then uh, it was interesting the way her father had willed the property to her. He actually set up how the property was going to pass for two generations. So it went first to Marion. If Marion had children, it would go to her children. If she didn't have children, it would go to her brother's children. And so as it happened, she didn't have children. Uh, her nieces and nephews stood to inherit it. And she requested that they consider giving the property to the National Trust for Historic Preservation, which is what happened and is why we have mm -hmm. uh, Montpelier as a National Trust site today. Wow, that's just so incredible. I feel like our conversation has kind of gone full circle in thinking about, you know, the different women um, who, um, you know, lived and loved and labored, you know, at Montpelier, um, the ways in which um, historic preservation um, has um, really uh, been central um, at Montpelier. Um, and, you know, one of the interesting stories that I understand is, um, you know, related to the War of 1812 um, and the burning of the White House um, and Dolly Madison and Paul Jennings, you know, um, their presence and uh, wherewithal to save the um, portrait mm -hmm. of George Washington. Um, and so when I think about some of the themes we've talked about, whether it's bipartisan, um, you know, collaboration, whether it's collaborations in historic preservation, um, it's, it's just really interesting to me to think about the ways in which women have been um, so central um, in um, every aspect of that at Montpelier. Um, and, you know, just with your, your thoughts there in, in closing and thinking about, um, Gilmore Cabin um, and um, Rebecca Gilmore Coleman, um, as well as um, the DuPont family and um, uh, Marion DuPont's, you know, request uh, to transfer uh, Montpelier to the National Trust. Um, it's just, um, I think, pretty consistent in the world of preservation that women are are thinking about our, our lasting legacy. Um, and so, any final thoughts um, for um, our, our community who joined us tonight for the live or will, will watch this video. It will be posted on our YouTube, you know, and thinking about preserving the legacy of liberty um, and uh, the ways in which women um, continue to be a central part of that story. Well, what do you want everybody to think about and remember? Well, I think the women of Montpelier really left a legacy of strength. Mm -hmm. And it's a combination of Dolly Madison and her political savvy. It's uh, the 
the courage of somebody like Catherine Taylor to stand up for her legal rights in a court that she had no idea if it was going to side with her or not. It's Marion DuPont Scott making her way in the male dominated world of racing. It's Rebecca Gilmore Coleman sticking up for preservation of the cabin. So I just think there's a lot of strong women in that story, even Mrs. Gooch who had the courage to say no when she didn't have time to spin that wool. Wow. Um, well, I tell you, Hillary, it is a real privilege um, to work with you, to collaborate with you. Um, I was looking forward to this conversation and you have absolutely expanded my knowledge and awareness of uh, the many women who have helped to shape Montpelier and had an impact on American history, American society. Um, I know research, we continue to do the research. Um, and so this work isn't done. Um, and, um, you know, I, I just appreciate you. And um, I wondered if there's any, um, I, I can't see all of our wonderful questions here um, in the chat. Are there any questions in the chat we should get to you before we close um, this evening? Yeah. Uh, one, we got one message here from Big B Jr. He says that he is a direct paternal descendant of Henry Wood Moncure, who purchased Montpelier from Dolly Madison. He said he's never heard of him being recognized for saving Montpelier, being parceled out by Payne Todd. Wow. Wow. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight, and we hope that you will stay in touch. Uh, much of this work that we have done um, with descendants is um, very broad um, in a lot of ways, and, you know, there are descendants of Madisons, descendants of um, DuPonts, um, and so, yes, we are so pleased to meet you, um, and we'd like to stay in touch, um, and so um, if you're able to um, reach out to us at, at through the website, um, contact um, montpelier.org. Um, that would be excellent. Um, and, and we would look forward to um, sharing more about your family history. Um, and, and do you want to say anything, Hillary, about sort of the, that time period from um, 1844 to 1901 and how the property changed hands? Sure. Uh, there were about seven different owners, I think, in that time period, uh, most of whom were not here for a long time. Uh, Moncure was, uh, Henry Moncure was the one who purchased it from Payne Todd and Dolly Madison. And uh, we, we have some of their letters. We get a sense that uh, Moncure was kind of a friend of the family before he became the purchaser of Montpelier. And we certainly like to learn more about him. We've, we've done some research, but if, uh, the opportunity to talk to the Senate would be very yes. exciting. Yes, most definitely. And then the, the owners who had Montpelier the longest in that interim period between uh, Madison's and DuPont's uh, were two brothers, the Carson brothers, and they were Irish immigrants. And uh, one of the brothers was living here during the Civil War period. And so we actually have uh, quite a few Civil, Civil War soldiers uh, letters that mention having uh, met Mr. Carson and how he had shown them around the property and so forth. Wow, I can only imagine. I have to share with everyone, I have three boys, seven, 14, and 18 and my seven-year-old as we went through the gates at Montpelier and we're driving on the landscape and he saw all these different historic buildings he says wait are we traveling back in time wow. <laughs> and I tell you that is an interpreter's dream <laughs> we absolutely plan for that moment where we do want to have that opportunity to sort of take a step back in time and think about you know these different um, people and stories and and how we shaped a nation. Um, and so I thank you all um, for joining us um, for this uh, Monday moment with Montpelier. Um, we're planning to continue these, um, so stay tuned um, as the Montpelier Descendant Committee and the Montpelier Foundation come together um, for these uh, Monday moments um, and share um, the history uh, and um, what um, brings us um, together in telling all stories. And so um, thank you so much. Have a good night, um, and we'll see you again in two weeks.
拜拜。Bye.